Well, hey, internets, it's Jake from Mini Terrain Domain, and this is not our usual scribes and scrolls. But by now, you, were, you weren't expecting that. This is Interlude 2, focusing on Assyria, and it is called The Wolf Girl. Uh, this is the second of our interlude series. We are doing five interludes, one with each of the characters uh, throughout the next few weeks. Uh, just a note that uh, though you may see us interacting with you in the chat, we are not actually live. These episodes are pre-recorded so that we could um, actually have the month of uh, December off to rest and recover, but I will be in chat and one or more of the players may also be there with you. Um, so if you are familiar with, and you may see the, the text alerts and things popping up from time to time about domain tomes, domain tomes are not in play for these interludes. However, we encourage you to please support the channel, support the players by tipping and cheering, subscribing to the channel. Uh, you can support on Ko-Fi or Coffee as well. Um, and we will be tracking that. And when we return in the new year, all of those uh, domain tomes will be awarded to the players. Um, so these sessions are, are going to be a little bit different. Um, uh, by now you've possibly already seen our first interlude focusing on Tira. This is an opportunity for me as a dungeon master and storyteller and my players today, uh, Jordan as Assyria, um, to spend a little bit more time delving into these characters and what has made them, uh, what has shaped them or who has shaped them into who you see in the regular weekly sessions. Um, we play shorter games, so you don't necessarily get as much time to delve into backstories as as we'd like. And these are also excellent opportunities to see things from a single player's perspective, a single character's perspective, that the other players can watch these uh, and most likely will watch these and learn more about their their fellow party members. But it's all that meta knowledge, you know, it's third third person knowledge. Um, but there, so these are half experiment and half just an excuse to play more D and D and <laughs> which we don't really need excuses, but it's always great to have more opportunities to play. Um, I do want to at least mention, if you look down on the lower left corner, our channel sponsors, uh, run, right, play and talent and claw, their information will pop up in the chat. Please do check those out. Um, and uh, before we get started here in a moment, as always, I want to remind you that you matter. Your presence here on this earth makes a difference. Uh, whether or not you believe that, it, it's true. Um, you might be struggling with something. Uh, you, you, you may be in a place where you're just not okay. And first off, we want you to know it's okay to not be okay. It is okay to struggle. It's okay to have low times but you don't have to do so alone. Um, the best thing that you can do is to find some kind of help. Uh, depending on what you're going through will depend on what kind of help it is you need, but maybe you don't know where to turn. Uh, it can be as simple as typing the word exclamation point help in the chat. And uh, that will bring up uh, a link, and I'll tell you that link now. Find a helpline dot com. Uh, it is an excellent free resource. No matter where you are located in the world, you will find help services for a variety of, uh, mental health and other services, uh, ranging, um, from maybe you're looking for a therapist or maybe you, you or somebody, you know, is struggling with domestic abuse or, uh, drug addiction or any of those kind of things. All of these resources will pop up. If I put my location in, I think I get like 18 different uh, types of help and I can pick. And then that takes me to a list of uh, resources in my area for phone numbers, websites, text numbers, 
Um, it's an incredible resource, and we encourage you to use that. <clears throat> With that, I think it's time to play some Dungeons and Dragons and get into the interlude, Assyria, the Wolf Girl. We see a quick shot of leather booted feet running, splashing into uh, a creek, the muddy banks scrambling up the side. Immediately next to uh, these leather booted feet, we see the four uh, almost black furred paws of a wolf scrabbling through uh, and up the bank as well as uh, they scramble and immediately begin uh, charging through the brush, dodging through brambles around trees. We catch a glimpse of a... Um, pale skinned fingers as they grab a branch and use it to pivot themselves around uh, we see the muzzle of a wolf low to the ground running quickly alongside we catch a glimpse of a braided uh, a long uh, plate braid of hair uh, just disappearing behind a tree We hear a quick labored breathing of a woman who is running. And immediately we see the uh we see the um and hear the quick panting of the uh the wolf as it is also breathing in an attempt to keep up with uh, the girl, uh, though the wolf knows it could easily outrun and overtake her. Uh, it is staying close by. Um, and you see the wolf's eyes wide, one blue eye and one green eye, as Assyria and Sorin are being chased. But we don't see by what yet. Assyria, take us inside your thoughts as a mysterious figure as yet unknown to us is chasing you. What are you thinking? What are you doing? How are you trying to get away from uh, this person? Um, so as Assyria and Soren are running quickly, uh, she's also trying to be mindful. <laughs> Her steps are light. She's trying not to make too much noise as well as um, trying to make sure that she's not leaving too much of a track, even though that's something that she knows she won't be able to prevent. Um, she is scanning the forest for any kind of like thing that could either be weaponized or thing that could be a spot to hide um, she is kind of looking around quickly making sure every so often that Soren's okay knowing that he's fine but trying every possible way she's not used to being hunted so this is a very new feeling for her and one that she hopes that she won't be experiencing too often <laughs> Make me a stealth roll for both you and for Soren. Uh, Soren got way better than I did. Soren got a 19. Okay. Asteria <laughs> got, thankfully, with a plus six, a nine. She's she's a little bit too worried and probably stumbles on a branch, making a little bit more noise um, as she's running. 
That's not good. <laughs> uh, I would also like you to make a survival check for sure. me real quick. Oh, that's a lot better. Okay. Um, that is going to be a 24. You know exactly where to step to not dig too much into the ground. You know how to grab onto a tree and use it to uh, quickly turn without pulling the branches down. Uh, you know, even as you're, you're running and trying to survive, you recognize the, that flora that is uh, valuable, the medicinal herbs that grow wildly. Uh, you know the plants that are poisonous to touch, the poison ivies, the poison oaks, the um, razor vines, things like that. And you're doing your best to avoid them, and you're doing well at that. Conversely, in trying to preserve the living flora around you, you are paying a little too close attention. And every other step, you are stepping on broken branches. You're stepping into a leaf pile. You're making a lot of noise. And every time, Soren sort of keeping low, Soren barely making a sound, just kind of gives you this sidelong look as if to say, come on, girl. You find a moment where uh, you hear uh, the, actually, in, make, a, make a perception check for me. <clears throat> uh, perception that's going to be a 14 you can definitely hear where this person following you uh, you can hear them they're not paying attention to where they step they are crashing through um, paying no heed to what they uh, break through uh, they are a large person and you can hear their footfalls uh, you find a place where you think, based on where you can hear them, that you can catch your breath. You can hide behind a little thick area of trees. Would you stop there, or would you continue running? Make sure you keep running. She knows she's making too much noise, and for that noise to all of a sudden stop at a point, even though it might give her cover. You pause it's, for yeah. just a moment, and you hear their footsteps stop. And then you take off again, realizing you need to put more distance. And you hear a voice call out through the woods at you. I might not be able to see you, girl, but I can hear you. Yeah, keep running. It's going to make it all the more enjoyable when I finally catch you. <laughs> Do you respond at all? Just to say a word. Okay. As you continue running, I would like you to roll me a d20. All right. Uh, adding anything or? Nope, straight d20. 13. Okay. Uh, go ahead and make me another uh, stealth check. Okay. <laughs> oh, God. Okay. 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 Uh, Soren, dirty 20. Uh, Asaria this time got a 17. All right. 17 versus. A 17. You are charging through the trees, the, the, the brush and the, the, um, the branches and the leaf cover and stuff on the ground in this part of the woods uh, is more sparse. So you're having to pay less attention to avoiding trampling things. Uh, but the trees are thick and closer together. 
And as you're running through, you suddenly hear, <laughs> and you glance over, and not 12 feet away from you is the man who is chasing you. You can see he is about six feet uh, and some inches tall. He wears uh, leather trousers and he wears a uh, he wears a sword belt uh, and you've seen the uh, the axes in his sword belt. You've seen the long sword he carries. You've seen the javelins on his back. Um, but the thing that has stood out to you the most from the time you first saw him was the wolfskin cloak that he wears. And even now, this cloak trailing behind him as he runs, uh, despite the chill air wearing uh, little more than a spun linen, loose spun linen um, shirt, um, as he moves f pretty quickly, trying to catch up to you, and he's dodging around these trees, um, and... Uh, he comes in close and you suddenly hear <laughs> as one of his hand axes swings out and <laughs> into uh, the tree where you were just a moment ago he misses striking you and all of a sudden you hear him uh, not so much cry out as you just hear this <laughs> Oh, bloody hunters. And uh, make a quick perception check. Sure. Uh, perception? Mm -hmm. That is going to be a 19. Uh, you look and see that um, he appears to have stumbled into a hunter snare. Uh, let's see. He, yeah, uh, he stumbles into a hunter snare and it's, it's not strong enough to, uh, you know, to completely, you know, lay him up, but this snare acts as tangle foot as, uh, it gets caught around his foot and you see that he had stumbled. He didn't fall, but he's kind of staggering. He's now bent down. <laughs> And he whips out a big knife from uh, his belt and is cutting away at this as you start, or rather continue, charging into the brush. Would I have a second to grab the hatchet that got embedded in the tree as I'm running? Um, make a strength check. Oh no, I don't know why I asked. Okay. Uh, that is going to be a 16. Yeah, uh, I, I, I see this as he is crouched down. He's about 20 feet away from you. And he's cutting away at this, this snare. And you can now see that it looks like two or three snares were set up along uh, a rabbit run. And he just kind of got caught up in them. He's quickly cutting through them and then the camera sort of rack focuses and we see the hatchet sticking in the tree and you just reach up and <laughs> yeah i imagine she's doing kind of a, a a move that's usually done a lot slower it's a dance move her mother taught her to kind of step forward and use the momentum to kind of wrench the hatchet out and then spin back around and continue forward so you grab you grab this hatchet and you continue running? Yes. All right, roll me, roll me a d20 one more time. Okay, a regular one? Yep. Uh, three. Three? Yep. It's my favorite number, but not right now. You... You grab this hatchet, you do this dance move, 
to to move in and kind of use your your flowing movement to get the leverage to pull uh pushing up rather than pulling down on this hatchet and just freeing it and you you turn around and uh you go darting between these again through these close together trees and uh you find yourself running straight through spider webs uh, not like giants but just regular spider webs yep. but you feel that that you immediately know that it's in your hair it's in your face ooh uh, -oh. uh and unfortunately for you mm -hmm. um it is an active uh spider's nest but not spider's nest that sounds well, horrifying no that is they do nest <laughs> well yeah uh, but, uh <laughs> you're lucky i rolled three ones on these four d4 uh Ooh. you take seven points of piercing damage <sighs> um as you stumbled right into this spider's nest it's a pretty good sized spider uh, yeah. It's also very brightly colored. I need you to make a constitution saving throw. Oh, no. Okay, con save. Uh, that's going to be a 15. Uh, so you won't be Spider-Man today, but... Uh, uh, no, you, you stumble into this. You see the spider as you're pulling yeah. away, and you feel... Uh, you see it after you feel uh, a bite on your neck. Yeah. Um, that hurts quite a bit, and you know that this is going to probably swell up uh, and be painful for a while. Um, and as you're kind of pulling away, you see this this spider. You know, this thing is probably about this big, uh, sort of a bright yellow uh, yeah. with green legs, and you see it scurrying off um, and back up a tree, uh, but you don't feel um any like burning of venom reaching in through your body you are not poisoned by it yay wow so keep running the camera pans away as you uh turn and you and soren run into the woods and it pans to uh this this man, this human man that was chasing you as well, first we see the camera sort of low to the ground and the two of you rush off into the woods and we see that spider sort of just start to move, uh, moving like it's getting ready to re-spin its web. And then we see this, this, uh, thick human hand splat! crush the spider against the tree and then the camera swings around and we see this human man six foot three um the sides of his head are shaved he has a tangle of dirty blonde hair pulled back into a top knot and uh he has a very scraggly but long uh dirty blonde beard and he just looks at his hand and just kind of wipes it on his shirt. Yeah. Keep running. I'll catch you eventually. The camera fades to black. If this were a TV show... Uh, or a movie, we would see the words three days earlier appear on screen <laughs> as uh, at the edge of the woods we see a serious face peering out through the trees and in a shadow space between branches, we can just see the blue and green eyes of Soren also peering out through the trees. I would like you to roll me three d20s. Don't add them, just tell me okay. what each one of them is. Okay. Oh. Uh, so the numbers are 14. 
Okay. 17. Okay. And a 20. All right. So uh, with those rolls, it is uh, the temperature is pretty average for the time of year. Um, it's not terribly hot, um, but it's not terribly cold either. There is a bit of uh, wind, but nothing super strong, but it is raining heavily. As the two of you are peering out from the cover of the trees. We shift focus to over your shoulder as we see through the branches from your perspective of what you're looking at. It is a town, not a large town. It's a settlement. Um, it's the kind of place that looks like it might have about 500 people that live in the area. You have been heading towards this town for a few days. What is the reason that you know that you need to stop in town? Assyria, you spend a lot of your time in the woods. Yeah. Uh, but you know from time to time you need to stop in the settlements for various reasons. What brings you to this town? One thing, I think, a home-cooked meal. like. Yes, she is known to be cooking and, and living in the forest, but every now and then she gets the hankering um, and can't, can't kind of stop herself from wanting to stop into one of the taverns, sitting by her fireside, and even if it's just to herself, uh, kind of pretending um, she's at home. Um. So I don't think she can every so it's very rare, but every so often she really wants to stop in. Um, and if they have it, she will uh, always order um, a chicken pot pie. Always. So, yeah, it definitely uh, makes sense that in particular now because it has been raining uh heavily like this for the last four days when it's raining this heavy for this long it it's difficult to track uh animals it is uh difficult to forage um and by now you're four days soaking wet um even finding shelter and building a fire at night, uh, just about the time you start to feel like you might be dry and warm, you have to travel again. Um, and uh, I imagine as you're looking at this town, and even with the pouring rain, it's, it's mid-afternoon at this point, or maybe early afternoon at this point, uh it's by no means dark just gray um the rain is is falling steadily you see a couple wagons rolling by uh you hear the creaking and rattling uh, and you see as they are digging ruts in the mud um you see a few people running back and forth and we hear just this of Assyria's stomach growling as you can see just a little ways into the town, uh, you see a tavern, an inn, that has the warm glow of lights coming from it. And even from here, you can smell cooking food. You can smell the ale. As your stomach growls, I imagine you just hear this whimper from Soren who is just sitting there kind of yeah licking his lips I should kind of look at Soren actually when uh, her stomach growls not wanting to admit that it's her and she'll look at Soren and be like not so loud I'm trying to be quiet 
not me. So don't look at me like that. It's you. Just not wanting to even admit or entertain it. Well, do you think we should stop in or should we move on? Soren kind of, again, uh, you see him licking his lips and kind of does that half... He he's sitting next to you, but he kind of half stands up, and and you just hear just the barest. Uh, ooh, ooh, ooh. All right, all right. I hear your argument. Uh, these are really good topics you're bringing to the table, and a reason to go into town. All right, but no. And she'll get really close to, like I say, no taking food from other people. You know what I'm talking about. The last town you took a hand from one of the stands that caused quite a ruckus. No doing that. Mm -hmm. No. You want bacon time later, right? Ears perk up. That's what I thought. Hmm. All right. If you want that, you have to behave. A little bit. And she'll kind of uh, give him a kiss on the head, ear scratches, mm. and then uh, head into town. Kind of at this point, she has her hood up. Um, she's trying to offer, even though it's futile, but she will <laughs> extend her arm with her cloak on it to give Soren a little bit of shelter <laughs> as she's walking. Just trying, you know. Um, she hasn't gotten the wolf uh, parasol figured out just yet, but eventually. So, as you are uh, entering into this town, um, you you pass by a couple of um. A couple of the businesses um, in town. Uh, you're coming in uh, from the woods. Uh, you pass by. Uh, you can see that there's a uh, what appears to be be a uh, a wagoneer um, shop. It's a you can you can see uh, carts and wagons in various states of repair. Wagon wheels leaned up all against the side of the building. Uh, you can even hear the the rhythmic pounding of a hammer on wood and see uh, sticking out from the shelter of of a uh, open faced uh, building almost like a barn but but that's covered uh, there's a wagon that's propped up on some logs and there's a uh, muscled man that looks to be in his mid fifties um just hammering away as it looks like he's trying to to fit a wagon wheel back on um you uh pass by uh another place that looks to be um some sort of a, a general store um you can see the uh barrels out front and a few stacked uh, sacks of grain and in the windows, you see things like rope and lanterns, uh, picks, um, and things like that. Uh, continuing along through the street, uh, a few people are passing by, um, huddled up as well, jackets pulled up or hoods pulled up. As they quickly move from one location to the next, you get a couple of looks. Uh, not so much from you, but from the fact that you have a large black wolf walking alongside mm -hmm. you. Um, it's people, by now I imagine this is a, a look you're familiar with. As people do the double take, assuming you have a dog with you, and then they kind of, and uh, you see a woman sort of grab at her uh, eight or nine year old son and just kind of push them behind and around her to the other side uh, as they quickly put their head down and just move past a um, couple wagons can pass you by um, 
Make a uh, dexterity check. Okay. Uh, dexterity, that's going to be a 21. Um, Soren cuts in front of you in the way that he does when he's trying to stop you from moving into a place he doesn't want you to go. Mm-hmm. As you go to cross, you, you're kind of walking in on a side thoroughfare, and you go to cross the main thoroughfare. Soren steps in front of you as a wagon comes around the corner. And if you had stepped out, it would have slammed right into you. Um, you get a little bit of mud that sort of sprays up, but not terrible. Um, as you come onto the main thoroughfare and you see uh, that on that corner is this this inn what is the name of the inn that you see uh the name of the inn that i see is uh a land's post a land's post e-l-a-n a land's post Mm mm-hmm and it has um, on the actual sign, uh, you see what appears to be an owl kind of perched on its little, like a branch or a post. Um, kind of little. All right. Yeah. Well, you can, as you look up at this sign, the land's post, you hear the. <laughs> as somebody comes out from the swinging saloon style doors on the front of this place. A man uh, looks to be in his forties. He has a a heavy oil skin uh, jacket with, and he just kind of pulls the collar up. He puts on a, uh, a wide brimmed hat and uh, he seems to almost by habit, uh, pull out a pipe and looks like he's about to light it and then he kind of looks and he looks at you looks you up and down sodden and wet and then he just goes ah bugger it I can wait till I get home tucks <laughs> it into his pocket just gives a little tip of his hat to you um and he quickly runs across the street and heads off to who knows where but in his wake You smell all of the cooked food and the ale and the spirits. You smell the mix of the uh, black cherry tobacco smoke from this man's pipe. You smell the, uh, the aromatic logs of the fire in the hearth in this place and the warmth just emanating. Do you enter? I'll look at Soren again. Mm-hmm. Behave. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and step forward, murmuring to him again, also stay close. Um, as she will carefully enter the tavern. Behind you, the door swings closed again. <laughs> And, uh, looking around, nobody, nobody suddenly turns and, and looks to see who came in. A couple people glance in your direction and immediately look back. Um, as I said, it's early afternoon. Uh, the crowd that's in here looks like they might be a little more people than you would expect on, in the middle of the week. Uh, this early in the afternoon, but with the heavy rains outside, um, you know, people can't really be out working their fields and, and doing much in the way of outdoor work. So there's probably a couple dozen people in here at various table <clears throat> tables. Uh, conversations are, are relatively low. Um, in one corner, there's a group of, uh, Uh, Three women and a man uh, that appear to be playing some kind of a card game. 
um, and you see a few copper and silver pieces in the middle of the table and stacked in front of them as they're they they're gambling. Uh, they have uh, mugs of ale in front of them. Um, there's a large hearth off in one side, in front of which are um, uh, four uh, leather high winged. Uh, High backed wing wing back is the word I'm looking for. Uh <laughs> chairs. They look quite beat up. Um these chairs. Uh but they're see they're near the fireplace and there's uh, in one of them uh there is a uh an older halfling man. Uh he has a pair of half moon spectacles on as he's sort of peering down them as he's knitting something uh looks, <laughs> you can see from what's curled in his lap he appears to be knitting uh some sort of scarf or something um a couple other tables have a couple of people that look like they might be farmers or uh workers of of some type um enjoying a midday meal um there is a uh, a bar a little ways across that has some stools up next to it. A couple other random people are seated there as well. Um, and there is a, roll me a D5, D5, a D6. Uh, roll me a D6. D5. And a D20. Okay. Uh, the 20 is a 16 and the D6 is a four. All right. Uh, the barkeep is, um, the, the barkeep is a human woman. Um, she is also middle-aged. Uh, she's stout, looks to be almost six feet tall. She's got her sleeves rolled up. She has a heavy white, dirty stained apron on. Uh, her sleeves are rolled up. You can see a couple tattoos on her forearms. Uh, her hair is a um, sort of a faded green. Uh, looks like it may have once been a brighter green, uh, but you can see quite a bit of gray is coming through at the side. She's got it pulled back kind of into a messy bun um, as she's just standing in... in uh, at the bar, um, place, places a drink in front of one of the patrons at the bar, and it's just having a little conversation with them. Uh, she just kind of looks up over at you and and uh, kind of gives Soren a kind of just tilts her head and gives Soren a look. You can take a seat wherever you want. That's free. I hope that that animal is going to behave itself. I promise he will. He's trained. Take a seat. I'll be with you in the mo in the moment. Thank you. And she'll kind of bow her head kind of politely um, and try to find a spot along the wall. She does not want to be in the middle of the... She's a... Uh, she's not one to want to be center stage or in the middle of a room uh probably if there's a space along the wall or near a window even because she gets anxious after a while if she can't even see or be aware that there is another escape route she doesn't like being in buildings or within walls for too long because then it starts to feel like a cage so she gets a little anxious um yeah Make an investigation check as you look what? around trying to figure out where you're going to sit. Investigation? That's going to be a 13. Okay. Uh, you scan the room and uh, you can see that while there are several of the tables are these, these large round tables kind of placed around this room, uh, there is one wall to your right that has four booths that are uh, mostly unoccupied. Um, and immediately to your right, so as you walk in, there's almost like a uh, um, a half wall 
that extends yeah. out a little bit that kind of separates where the entrance is from over on this other side here. There is a uh, two booths that are uh, well, there's a one round table that's off in the corner by the window, and then there's two booths, uh, one that is just on the other side of the wall. You can't quite fully see it, uh, but then the other one um, that's there that's also open uh, that are right by the windows. She'll immediately kind of scurry over <laughs> um, and, and try to sit in the booth. She'll have Soren as much as she wants him to also share the booth with her, realizing, hey, a lot of people may not like animals up on furniture so she's gonna have him sit underneath right by her feet um or she can keep an eye on him as well so are you when you go around you're, you're basically are you taking the middle booth i would say the the far booth not the, the one closest to the window i think you mentioned there was there's three there's three tables that are right up by the windows. Okay. Immediately to your right. There's the one that's immediately on the other side of this half wall, a middle booth, and then a table that's in the corner by the windows. Got it. Okay, I misunderstood. Yes, then it would be the middle. Okay. As you you come around and uh you kind of direct Soren and you sit down, um you immediately hear a voice that says that's uh that's quite the handsome wolf you got there you look up and you see that sitting in that booth right around the corner from where you walked in is a human man uh he looks like he would probably be tall if he stood up um he's pretty muscular um Wears a loose fitting, loose spun shirt, has uh dirty blonde hair pulled into a top knot and a dirty blonde beard. Um you've never seen this man before. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, he just says that about Soren. Thank you. Uh, he's he's very good. Um, I'm sorry. Uh, what's your name? No, I'm sorry. I should have introduced myself before speaking. My name is Kane. Kane Morgram. Morgram. Pleasure. Uh, Asaria. Asaria. Mm -hmm. Does your wolf have a name? Of course. Uh, his name is Soren. Soren. Must say it's a bit unusual to see a domesticated wolf. I don't know about domesticated, but <laughs> he knows his manners. And she'll look down at him. <laughs> he knows. Well, I can't say as I'll blame you for seeking refuge here in uh, Elon's post. It's uh, quite miserable for traveling out there. I actually like the rain. Cleans the forest and kind of makes everything anew, but it can be a nuisance if you're traveling a bit. I find that travel tends to slow down a bit. And if you're a hunter, it can be difficult to track your prey and your meals. <laughs> you're right. Do you do a lot of hunting? I hunt a fair bit here and there, uh, enough to keep my belly full when I need to. Enough to feed my family, those around me, that rely on me, and from time to time I hire my services out. No. Oh. I'm sort of in between oh. jobs at the moment. Uh, Got it. Came here 
hoping to pick up some more work. That sounds promising. How you'd think. Can you believe it? A town like this, they don't even have a bulletin board. <laughs> well, they kind of strike me as a group that's pretty self-sufficient. Not necessarily needing, or perhaps wanting, outside help. Not from around here, then, are you? Definitely not. Now, this is, uh... This place here is a bit of a... A little bit of a farming town. And mm. you see those folks over there? The, the ones wearing the overalls? Mm-hmm. They work at the quarry on the uh, north end of town. Got it. You don't want to be working in a quarry when it's pouring rain like this. No. Makes for accidents. Imagine. Definitely. Well. I hope you enjoy yourself here. You too. And uh, have a pleasant meal. Thank you. About that moment, uh... You see, uh, and you probably would have noticed him as he kind of glanced as he said that, as this uh, woman, the barkeep, comes walking over to you. Um, she kind of glances under the table and gives kind of an approving nod that Soren is under the table. Soren is just <laughs> sort of head on his paws. His ears are up. As yep. he just kind of looks up at her and then just kind of looks over yeah. at you. Um, but you can tell he's got that look of he's got his head on his paws, but he is not resting. He is in waiting for morsels to drop mode. Oh, yeah. He's probably, there's probably, unfortunately, a small pool of drool. Uh, <laughs> probably just. <laughs> Fortunately, it's, it's blending in with the, the water that's <laughs> dripping off of your your clothes there and your yep. boots as she comes up and says, uh, Hello and welcome to Lone's Post. I would like to offer you uh, whatever you it is that you want to drink, as long as it's ale or spirits. Uh, we do have goat's milk, I guess, if you want that. And if you're looking for food, uh, we've got stews, uh, we've got meat plates. It's not Friday, so the charcuterie boards are not available. <laughs> and if you ask to see a wine list, I'm going to point you out the door. <laughs> oh, my type of place. Um, all right. I am kidding. <laughs> I like to, uh, I have a bit of a reputation around here as a bit of a hard ass. I like to keep up appearances. You hear from across the room, uh, one of the women playing cards goes, It's not just a reputation. She is an hard ass. <laughs> well, thank you for allowing me and Soren into this uh, establishment. Thank you. Not many people are uh, as welcoming. So, thank you. Well, uh, your name is? I'm Indra Galadin. Elon's Post is my, is my place. I run it. That's amazing. Yeah. It's a job. I keep <laughs> busy with it. Great. Ale. Spirits. Ale would be perfect for me. Can I get some water as well for Soren? She looks you up and down, soaking wet. Looks kind of outside. Hurting for water, are we? I'm and then she cracks a smile. Wearing it, you know, versus <laughs> drinking it. She cracks a smile. No, no problem. <laughs> Thank you. Bring you a, uh, bring you an ale. And, uh, tell you what, you like, uh, you like beef. Of course. You like chicken. Yes. All right. I've got something for you. You can pay, right? 
Yes, yes. I can pay. Uh, but yes, don't go to good. any special trouble for me. No, it's not. It's not special trouble at all. Uh, I have a... It's a sort of um, a shepherd's pie. It has beef and chicken, uh, peas, carrots, potatoes. Uh, it's in... Uh, it's in a nice, airy, fluffy, but crispy on the edges crust. Um, it's... Uh, I'm not going to tell you what the pie crust is made of. That is a family secret. I got it. Um, but I I have some already made in the back. It is delicious. I will bring it to you with the ale and everything. Uh, you're, you're only going to be looking at about four silver pieces. Okay. That's doable. That will go up if you keep drinking. Good to know. <laughs> All right, let me know if you need anything else. Um, can I actually also, uh, I know this is probably a bit weird, can I get something for Soren as well? What, what did you have in mind? A shepherd's pie or? Well, uh, not shepherd's pie. The, the breading isn't really good for, for wolf's digestion, and I don't think you or I really want to clean that up later. I mean, what? Uh, how a moment. Sure. Did you say he was a wolf? Yeah. She kind of takes a step back. You're telling me that's not a dog. He is not a dog. Yes, he's a wolf. But he's very well behaved. Again, but... Soren's eyes just kind of, they're, they're just doing that. <laughs> As yep. he's watching between the two of you and Soren just kind of, the ears just perked up, just mm. trying to, okay. just looking as, as uh, polite as possible. Yeah, I mean, see, we've been in your establishment now for, what, five, ten minutes, and no one's screaming, no one's hurt. He's very well behaved. I promise. All right, well... It's good you came at midday, midweek. There might be problems if it was an evening. But uh, it'll be all right, I think. Okay. She looks a little bit concerned. Um, uh, it doesn't have to be much, but if you have, like, some, some chicken legs or just some, some kind of meat, uh, that would be so great. And again, I'm more than happy to compensate. Um, I've got just the thing. I will be back in a few moments. Thank you. She takes a couple steps and kind of glances down again at Soren. Like. And then turns and walks away. The, uh, the man Kane just kind of says. Don't, don't let Indra intimidate you hmm. unless you're getting belligerent at night as part of the drunk crowd she won't hesitate to put you on your ass outside I'm I've been there once or twice myself in the <laughs> past more recently uh, but she makes a mean shepherd's pie That's good. and just a few moments later uh uh Indra comes out and uh she places a uh large probably eight inch across uh looks almost like a skillet in front of you and it's just overflowing with this like fluffy airy flaky crust you can see that it's been slit across the top in three places and you can just oh. smell the beef and the chicken and see the the peas and carrots and potatoes just in there she hands you uh a knife and uh a fork um and uh slaps down a half a loaf of dark bread um she sets a very large mug of dark beer in front of you and uh she also has a large wooden bowl that looks to be um the uh trimmings from beef and chicken 
Uh, there's plenty of actual beef and chicken meat in there, but there's also, uh, you know, they're good fatty pieces as well. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's a generous portion, um, that she, uh, sets down. She just crouches down, sets it on the floor and then kind of uses her foot to push it towards Soren. (laughs) Um, make a wisdom save for Soren. Okay. Oh no. I'm going to show it because I'm, I'm quite sad. It's a one. Soren just immediately. (laughs) And she kind of takes a step back. I'm so sorry. (laughs) Right. Well, He's really wolfing that down, huh? <laughs> uh, uh. Yes. I mean, it's, it's really good. He was very excited. So <laughs> it's it's compliments to the chef. Uh, and No compliments needed. Uh, you just let me know if you need anything else. I'll be all the way on the other side of the room on the other side of the bar. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Kane is sitting in the booth just smiling he's kind of looking over at Soren and he just kind of shakes his head <laughs> see I told you she wasn't anything to worry about Mm-mm. do you know what she meant though about the uh is it more than than the rowdy crowd coming in at night or is there perhaps something else happening it's mostly just you get, especially with, we've had, what, four or five days of this rain. You've got a lot of people with a lot of time in their hands. They can't work. Mm-hmm. And, well, they say the idle hands or the devil's playground. People get up to no good. If they can't take out their aggressions breaking rocks at the quarry. Well, they start breaking faces when they get drunk. Oh, got it. Good to know. If you don't mind my asking, you said you're not from around here. Mm-hmm. You're just passing through then? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't really like to stay in one place for too long. Do a lot of traveling then, do you? Yes, a lot. You, uh... Coming from the north, then. At this point, did I, DM, did I come from the north or from where this town is? Or did I come east, west, south? Based on your point of origin, I think that you've probably been traveling southward. Okay. So then, yes, she will. Uh, Yes, I came from the north. Anywhere in particular you headed? At this point, it's wherever my boots and Soren take me. So, they've been steering me pretty well so far. He kind of looks over to the side where uh, he can see where you're sitting in this booth. Your sword belt kind of sits off to the side, resting mm-hmm. against the floor. And I imagine you probably had to set your bow. Uh, yeah. Off to the side. Oh, it looks like you're a capable hunter and able to take care of yourself. I don't imagine too many people mess mess with uh, mess with you traveling in the company of a wolf. <laughs> well, I, I manage, but definitely Soren here has to keep me in line. Usually, it's the opposite. Usually, he's the one guiding me, but never we. Chance our way into town. I find I have to keep an eye on him. This is supposedly, I guess, if you want to call it my forest, is the town, but I don't really like it here. I can understand that. I'm a bit of the opposite, you could say. Hmm. When I was younger, I spent a lot of time in the woods. 
out of necessity. Didn't get into towns that often. Mm. Don't get me wrong, I like going traveling and heading out into the wilderness, leading people on hunts, uh, escorting the trader's wagon, merchants mm -hmm. here and there. Uh, I recently took on a job escorting some dwarves from Sundabar. Um, you know, the odd jobs here and there. Mm -hmm. But I like being able to get back into civilization, staying in towns, warm beds, warm fires, occasionally a warm party next to me. Mm -hmm. Can't be beat. Well. And you mentioned you had family? Yeah. Any I mean, don't we all have around? family of some sort, yeah? <laughs> I guess so. Yeah, I've got uh, brothers and sisters. Mm. Could say a lot of them, actually. Truth be told, they're not blood relatives, but we've bled together. Yeah, we've family. become kin. That's always good to have. Yeah, nothing like coming off a long job. Stopping, getting some good warm grub in your belly, getting some good beer in your belly, and coming home to the embrace of your brothers and sisters or your family. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's yeah. why I take jobs from time to time. <laughs> I got a lot of brothers and sisters. Got to get away from them sometimes. <laughs> I can imagine. You got family? Yes. And at this, it's very slight, but you can see her kind of stiffen um, ever so slightly. Um, yes. Um, and I'm familiar with the life you are speaking of. Uh, my father used to do the exact same thing, leading parties through um, the woods, being a ranger, a scout for them. Uh, I'm always wanting to come home, so I, I, I'm at least knowledgeable about what you're speaking of. Uh, but yes, I have family as well. Uh, mother, father, and an older brother. And then, of course, Soren here, so. You're traveling with your family, then? Uh... Not at the moment. Uh, they are exploring elsewhere. Um, with uh, and you see, she's she's kind of panicking a little bit, <laughs> a little bit. Um, my father has this whole idea of when you come of age, um, that you should travel and see the the world a little bit. Um, and since I am of age, uh, it's time for me to journey around a little bit get to see it get to experience new things and then return home and tell them all about it um, my brother has been on his journey for a while um but yeah so I'm, I'm off on my own for the moment but we'll see where this journey takes me whether it's deception or performance i need you to make a role it's a mix of both. <laughs> okay. Let's see. Uh, Just a reminder, domain tomes are not in play. <laughs> yep. Oh, yeah. So I rolled a one, and I have a negative one in both deception and performance because my charisma is really low. So <laughs> this is zero. <laughs> Um, there was truth in that, though, but not the entire truth. Make an insight check. Okay. Nope. Okay. <laughs> um, insight, it's a six. Okay. Yeah, I mean, you, uh, you think you're telling this, this tale mm -hmm. very smoothly, um, but you are full of ums and uhs and yep. 
and a lot of kind of that characteristic looking up into the left of somebody who's who's uh fabricating details mm-hmm. uh but Kane doesn't seem to give any indication that he's picked up on this or that he even knows uh that you're um telling a story There's aspects of truth, but yes. <laughs> <laughs> and uh he just he just kind of looks at you and he says so you just grabbing a quick meal and heading back out on the road or you plan mm-hmm. on staying here i think we're going to head out as soon as the weather lets up a little bit um just again i'm, I'm not one to like to stay in one place for too long right yeah as you said yeah and continuing to head south then yeah South or usually I check in with someone and see what direction we want to go in today. Wherever the wolf takes you. Exactly. Right. Well. He picks up his uh his horn of ale. Uh, well I've taken up enough of your time. Assyria. Fine. And Sorin. Thank you. I've got uh, business I've got to attend to as well. You stay safe out there. Thank you. And uh, he takes a couple of silver coins and drops them on the table. And he kind of slides out of the booth. Takes a look out at the weather outside. And... uh, he grabs a bundle, looks like a jacket or something, and he he walks around that uh that little half wall and he just kind of looks back at the bar and says Oh, Idindra. Good food, good drink as always. Be sure to stop by next time I'm on my way through. I threw a couple extra silver pieces here. Poor my friend here, another mug of the good stuff. And then he pulls on, you see as he suddenly throws around this cloak. Mm -hmm. And as he does, you see that he drapes a wolf fur cloak over his shoulders. Mm -hmm. He puts his hand on the swinging door, looks at you. It was nice meeting you, Assyria. Nice meeting you, Kane. And when you see him, give Melchior my best. And he heads out the door. And we cut. (laughs) Three days earlier. Assyria, I would like a d20 roll. Oh my god! You can just roll a pie, okay. Uh, 12. You are continuing to, uh, to run, uh, through the woods, being chased by this man, Cain. You look down at your hand and you have, or maybe you've tucked into your belt, you have one of Cain's hand axes. Yeah. Uh, that he threw at you quickly tucked it away make me a uh either i'm going to give you a couple options here because this is going to be depending on what your tactics are okay um let me let me respin this uh you tell me what you're attempting to do as kane is chasing you and has been chasing you uh for at this point probably close to an hour Okay. Um, what tactics are you using or what would you be attempting to do as you're trying to either uh, lure him somewhere, trying to escape from him? Uh, think of what type of uh, terrain you're trying to get to. Any, just how would you do this? How yeah. how would you and Soren, uh, you're being relentlessly pursued by someone. Yeah. Um. And he's far, how far behind right now? 
At this point, you don't know. He got caught in the snares, and you were able to escape from him. Um, it's only been... Um, uh, roll me a d10. Six. Six? Uh, it has been maybe a half an hour. Okay. Since you lost him, or last saw him when he was caught in with the snares. But uh, you know he's out there. Yeah. She is going to use every opportunity to try and confuse the tracks. So she's going to be overlapping over Soren. At points, she's going to pick Soren up, looking like we may be diverted or split up, uh, trying to confuse um, and, and use the terrain, like knocking over um, you know, any plants or branches that are loose, just trying to make this look like a disaster zone. Um, and then quickly and very carefully, um, she is going to try and find a spot with a vantage point um, that's slightly uphill if there's an area that okay. she can kind of plant herself and then confuse the tracks more and have sent Soren off a little bit. He's going to be separate from her, but she's going to be aware of where he's not going to be too far. Okay. I would like you to... There's a lot going on here, so we're going to do a couple of checks here. I want... Athletics or acrobatics for to determine how far you're able to get. Okay. Uh, I want stealth to determine um, how quietly you're able to do this. Mm-hmm. And I want survival to see how well uh, you obscure your tracks. Okay. So Acro- athletics or acrobatics. Got it. Stealth and survival. Stealth and survival. Okay. Acrobatics. Uh, that is going to be a 16. So yeah, you're you're moving deftly now. Uh, let, this is a complete antithesis to when we first saw you running through the forest. Uh, you, were, you were in sort of a more heavily vegetated area trying to avoid killing plants. Now you're in this... I'm picturing this terrain that you're in that there's a mixture of rocks and think almost like Pacific Northwest type. Uh, There's large like spruce trees and, and uh, other trees and um, large rocks and fallen logs. Uh, You're in an area where there's less foliage to worry about. So you're just looking at messing with and right now just being able to dodge around all of the the terrain stuff when it comes to when you pick you know pick soren up i imagine you and soren have have this kind of because of your closeness uh you can just give soren a quick hup, hup, yep. kind of and he'll like run up a log or up onto a rock and spring up and you can kind of you know almost shoulder carry him Um, or if you have to, you can sort of almost do like a fireman's carry where you sort of tumble roll and he's up on your shoulders. This, you've got this part of it down. You're able to make some good headway stealth to determine, uh, how quietly you're able to do this. 17. Okay. Uh, yeah, you're, you're moving deftly through the forest, uh, um avoiding those same branches you were breaking before he got before Kane got as close as he did. Um and that's going very well as far as you can tell. Uh now for obfuscating your uh trail. This is gonna be a survival roll. Uh twenty-four. Excellent. So you are absolutely you're you're crossing over tracks you're running into areas where you you sort of move you and soren are skipping across log to to rock to log and rock and back and forth before touching the ground again i am now going to roll for kane 
And I'm going to do the same checks. We're going to roll for him. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to roll athletics to see how well he's keeping up with you. Um, I'm going to roll his uh, perception versus your stealth. Uh, which you got a 17 on your stealth, yeah? Stealth, yes. And then uh, survival, you got a 24? Mm-hmm. I'll tell you, your survival uh, beat him by one. Um <laughs> He's really good at what he does. Yeah. But, um, you can't really gauge whether or not as you're, you're sitting there uh, in your, in your uh, observation point, and you're breathing heavy and you're trying to keep it quiet. Um, and uh, make me a investigation or perception check. Let's see perception that's going to be a 16 so from your vantage point are you high let me rephrase I've, that are you at a higher elevation i'm at a higher elevation right. i figured you meant higher elevation are you in yes. a tree or like up on a rock outcropping where what is this higher I elevation imagine there's probably an area in this forest that there is a like a large boulder that is like not pressed up against the tree, but it's right there. So the tree is giving partial yeah. coverage. So it's a perfect vantage point for her to, her view isn't perfect, but it's, you know, it's obscured with the branches, but she has a good view of what might be coming up. And, and this whole time you have the rain that is actually aiding in your attempts to, um, to dodge out of them. And, and it does help to obviously obscure uh, your, your, uh, heavy breathing from exertion and uh, because of the 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 heavy rain there's shadows that you're sort of melting into a bit um, and maybe what 30 40 feet away Soren is uh, in a position uh, where you only can see him uh, well actually roll roll perception or sorry stealth for Soren you know where Soren is there's no question about that yeah uh, for Soren, twenty-four. Um, he's a stealthy yeah. boy. You know, Soren is hidden, um, in the overhang of one of these trees. Uh, that the branches, especially heavy with rain, they're kind of drooping down. Soren is hidden low, and you see in the rain, uh. You see Kane come sort of charging into this clearing, and he's looking at the ground, and uh, he doesn't have any weapons drawn, but he's looking around, and you see him going, Oh no, you're here, girl. <laughs> but his looking around shows that he doesn't know where you are. You see him looking up, and he kind of throws his head back, and some of his hair has, has kind of come, come out of the top knot. And he pushes it back out of his eyes, and he's just looking. And watching you, or you're watching him. Mm -hmm. As he's looking around, he's trying to find you. What are you doing? His points. Etheria is going to have her longbow ready with an arrow in it. She is going to, if there's some loot, and, no, she's not going to do that. She knows better. She is going to Hunter's Mark. So you see the all of a sudden her eyes kind of flare up um, with a uh, green light um, and almost looks like leaves are kind of floating around her head in the rain um, as she's going to mark uh, 
She's going to mark his hand specifically. So underneath whatever armor, whatever he has, there's now going to be uh, the symbol of a, a leaf as she has marked him specifically. Um, and she is going to lose that arrow. All right. Yeah. She knows that at this point, if she keeps running, this is never going to end. And eventually someone, most likely her, is going to get tired. So she needs to, as much as she is not one to, to force her way into battle, she knows she needs to take a stand here because it's not only her life on the line right now, it's Soren's. Um, and she just keeps eyeing that that wolf skin cloak with just absolute anger. Um, but she is going to attack. And I think... I imagine what probably gives you that need, not only that desire uh, to protect yourself and Soren, but that need to eliminate Cain mm -hmm. is he looks up and he's just sort of, uh, he's looking in your direction, but he's kind of looking between where you and Soren are. And you can tell he doesn't know where you are. Mm-hmm. But he calls out, Emil Garcin Garav in Elvish. I will have your wolf. Mother. And you loose the arrow. Go ahead and make your attack roll at advantage. Because you are attacking from a hidden place. He has not located you. Natural 20. <laughs> wow. Go ahead. Uh, I will show it. Uh, I trust you. I uh, it's trust right here. you. Oh, it keeps going with the green screen, but it's right here. <laughs> I would like you uh, okay. to, uh, because it's a natural twenty, and in our campaign we use, uh, we use the brutal wounds system mm -hmm. um, from uh, from uh, uh, Jarl DM. Uh, our <laughs> My friend Lloyd, uh, we will have you roll, roll me a d12. Okay. Grab that. Uh, that's an eight. Uh, so this is going to be a strike somewhere in his mid torso section. So between shoulders and hips, mm -hmm. uh, you basically hit center mass. Um, I would like you to roll me a d20 and then go ahead and roll your damage. Okay. Uh, d20, that's a 10. Uh, okay. Um, you, you hit him almost center mass just to uh the left or to the right of his sternum um and you see the arrow strike with such force that it actually staggers him hmm. uh what was the damage the damage is i haven't rolled it yet uh which is max damage and then roll again okay uh so that'll be oh geez okay Eighteen, and then roll both the hunter's mark and the any. So yeah, all okay. all dice damage and modifiers are applied at maximum value. Okay. Then you roll any damage dice a second time, okay. and add that number. Ooh. Okay. Thirty-one points of damage. Thirty-one. Yeah, that makes sense for where the arrow struck. It's you see, it staggers him backwards, Ooh. and he, uh, as it hits him, he kind of reels back, and uh, he actually falls prone 
he, he trips falling backwards and he just <sighs> so that's how you want to play this huh. <sighs> and just with one fist he snaps the arrow off leaving just a small portion of it still embedded in his chest and you see as he goes <sighs> and he staggers up and I would like you to go ahead and roll initiative to okay. see if you can uh, maintain that mm. get another shot or if he's going to uh, I got a 10 I rolled a 3 plus 7 for initiative and I got a 17 <laughs> you see as Kane just gets up, staggers up to his feet. This arrow's broken off, and he kind of looks up, and uh, he's going to spot you uh, where you fired from. Yeah. Um, well, actually, go ahead and make another stealth roll if you attempt to hide after you take the shot. I think. Or do you just yeah, stand there? Would. Okay. Go he ahead would. and make a make a hide check, stealth check. No, <laughs> I rolled a one. <laughs> yeah, and he he got a fifteen on his perception as he looks up, and you see him go, <sighs> <sighs> "All right, this is the way you want it." Um, and you're sort of you ran up this rock outcropping um let me just check something uh, i think i didn't add something or does that not come in yet okay um yeah he comes running at you, but there's something strange in the way he's moving as this wolf cloak weighed down by by the just being saturated with water um doesn't really fly behind him, but you see him go oh, oh, and he throws his hands down and he runs not like athletically but he runs really low to the ground mm-hmm. You see him leap. Well, that is a natural 20 on an athletics check. Uh, giving him a 23 as he runs. And you see him leap almost unnaturally, kind of arcing his back as he... And he grabs the tree that's near you. He just skips running up the mm -hmm. uh, the rocks. He grabs the tree and you watch as he does so his hands look like massive bear claws and you see these long claws digging in to the tree as he looks at you and you see his face is taking on almost this bear like look now there's elements mm. of the human there but he now has this snout of a bear and he gives that of, of a grizzly. And uh, he is going to reach out and take a slash at you with a bear claw, uh, which I just have to check how he does this. There it is. Um, so that is going to be... Uh, as he does so, uh, with only a seven, hmm. he rips away one of the branches that your partial cover where you were hiding. This claw just whips through and you just see branch shatter. <laughs> and you have a real close good look at this yep. man who is mostly man, but he has like bear claws and, and a bear face. And he's right in front of you what would you like to do quickly switch Lombo out draw 
Melchior's sword. Um, and she is going to move forward and try and hit him. All right. Uh, I don't think a 14 hits. Let me check. Uh, 14 does hit. Oh, okay. Beautiful. Okay. That's me. Uh, 10 points of damage as she just kind of is not even like swiping down. She's just thrusting forward using that momentum as he's coming forward to just knock him. And with the claw that missed you, he sort of maneuvers, you know, doesn't really stop you from cutting into him, but it more slashes across his belly. And you can see that the hair uh, where, where you slice into his shirt, you see some of this bear hide uh, seems to be growing out of his skin, and your blade is unable to cut as deep um, as uh, you only do half damage to him. And he looks down uh, at the sword blade where you cut him, um, and he is going to, uh, you, as you lunged forward, you're, you're in really close now mm -hmm. and you just feel the hot breath of, of him as he, and he is going to attempt to bite you. Mm -hmm. That's a 23 to hit. That hurts. So as you lunge in. He <sighs> right into your shoulder. Ah. Um, and that's gonna do Ooh, that's gonna do ten points of piercing damage as these massive uh teeth ah. dig into your shoulder. Um at this point, uh as the pain flares across your vision we cut to this as he bites into you in this flare of pain there's just <laughs> strike a thunder uh the flash of lightning and we see uh you and soren um as uh you are leaving this small town, leaving behind you um, Elon's post. After, how long after uh, Kane left is up to you? Would you, after Kane said what he said when he left, did you immediately take off looking for him? Or did you let him go and, and eat your meal, finish eating your meal? Uh, and go out later. What do you do? I think she would have eaten her meal <laughs> and just been the whole time like, he didn't say that. No. Almost, this is really good. No, he didn't. No. Almost like you imagined. Yeah. You're not entirely sure. The longer you sat there eating, you weren't sure. Um, so you and Soren are leaving this town behind you. What direction are you headed? West. West towards the coast. I'm sorry, east then. I, well, I mean, you're east. not you're not at the sea coast. The yeah, coast no, is but she would have gone away, east. But... No, I I switched okay. east and west in my head for a hot moment. Uh, she would have headed east. Okay. So you head east out of uh out of town. You pass a few of the businesses. Um, and. There's still this, even though you've mostly dismissed it as maybe imagined, uh, even thinking this has caused you to think about your father. And almost involuntarily, your hand 
goes to the pommel of the long sword that you wear on your sword belt. And in a, uh, in a bit of an inception, uh, we have a mm. bit of a flashback within a flashback. Um, within a flashback? Are we three levels deep? Um, I think we might be. As, uh, as you put your hand on the pommel of your sword, the view changes as we see you putting your hand on a doorknob. The doorknob is tarnished. The wood of the door that it is attached to is black with ash. As you pull open what remains of the front door of the burned out husk of your family home. You haven't been here since the night you saw it burning and you disappeared into woods and took shelter in the cave. It's been probably at this point a couple of weeks as you pull open this door and look inside to the burned interior of what was once a large cottage home on the edge of the woods we hear a little whimper next to you there is a very small black mm -hmm. wolf pup with one blue and one green eye struggling to climb over a piece of fallen burnt timber um but scrambles and sort of topples head over heels and then lands <laughs> and you hear this hur, hur, little pup bark as soren catches up to you as you prepare to enter the family home you're looking for something what do you do I think she'll actually pick up Soren. Um, kind of help him out also with how wrecked this place is. She's worried about the uh, foundation and what might topple. As soon as you pick him up, he's <laughs> it's assuming it's playtime, lightly chewing on your hand. <laughs> yep. uh, she'll. <laughs> I imagine she actually has this. She'll reach into her side where she has a literally a makeshift kind of bag. And it's a bunch of twigs wrapped together, which is the makeshift chew toy <laughs> for it. him. <laughs> it's just, it's literally like a really large, it's not super large, but a large kind of branch and then a bunch of little smaller ones kind of tied together uh, with some string um, or uh, really. If you've seen uh, timber when it's really cut down, like the etchings, it, it, it's almost paper-like. So mm -hmm. it's wrapped around almost like a ribbon and that she'll just kind of give on, <laughs> to just nod on <laughs> for a little bit. And she just kind of holds him uh, and is moving through what remains of her home. As you do so, you're... You are... Uh quite disheveled uh, you 100% look like a girl who has been living in a cave in the woods uh, and living amongst wolves uh, you are very disheveled you are very dirty um, there's probably sticks and leaves in your hair and and uh, none of this seems to bother you uh, mm -mm. as you are moving into the house you barely recognize what was once your home just a few weeks ago you enter into what would have been uh, the kitchen area the house opened right into the kitchen um, the large butcher block table uh, where uh, your family prepared so many meals together um, 
is charred. It was thick wood. It still stands, but it is charred. Um, and it is covered in, in broken timbers of the collapsed roof of this house. Moving through here is difficult. Uh, but you are able to sort of duck through underneath fallen timbers and move through the various rooms that that you see uh, the hearth that your family would sit around in the evenings, uh, the table you would take meals at. Um, you see what remains uh, as little more than a pile of ash, Melchior's favorite chair. Um, you see uh, one, uh, or rather two legs completely broken away. Uh, the table, uh, the what was once a, a small writing desk, but um, where Thedric would study. Um, you see that broken in the corner. But it's, uh, it is the hearth in particular, near the hearth, where you know that what you were looking for was normally up, up uh, mounted up above the fireplace. Uh, but even looking over there, you don't see it mounted to the wall. There's no sign of it. You make your way over there and um, go ahead and make me an investigation check. Eleven. You are digging around in the ash at the base of this fireplace. And it takes you quite a bit. Uh, you get, um, you actually get, uh, at one point you kind of pull your hand back sharply as, uh, there is a, um, an iron, uh, nail that was exposed that as you're digging around, you kind of catch your hand on, um, and you end up with a little bit of a cut across your hand. It takes you several minutes of, uh, digging, but then your hand through the ash finds cold steel. And you're gripping the hilt of Melchior's sword. Take over the narration as you withdraw this sword from the ashes. Um, she'll withdraw from the ashes. Um, kind of... shakily at this point you know this was a uh, <laughs> one of those things that your parents told you do not touch so she's very much hearing more so her mother uh but hearing their voices in her head right now as she's touching something that's synonymous with her dad and it just kind of brings a flood of different memories back to her. Um, you know, him with the, the sword in the, the yard. Um, her and him practicing with sticks. <laughs> um, just kind of brings that flood of memories. And then it pans back to she's sitting in a hovel of ash um, as she kind of actually even draws the blade slightly, not completely from the hilt or um, it's, it's casing essentially just to look and make sure like this is real. Cause she can't even 
fully process the destruction that's been left behind, but this survived. The leather is of the scabbard is grimy with ash, but as you pull the sword partially out of its scabbard, you see the gleaming, almost silver of the metal. The polished steel of this sword and it stands in stark contrast to the grays and blacks of ash all around you you're standing in the ruins of what was once your family home remembering melchior remembering venora and thadric And as you hold Melchior's sword in your hand, you look over, you remember Melchior sitting there in his favorite chair, and you remember Venora, your elven mother, doting on, the, sitting on the seat and doting over Thadric, um, who she always paid more attention to than mm -hmm. you, uh, for seeming almost as if it were in direct counterpoint to the amount of time and attention uh, Melchior spent with you. Uh, Venora spends as much, if not more, time with Thadric. Thadric, who has never had an interest in learning the ways of hunting, uh, who had no interest in wielding the sword, uh, or learning how to use a bow. Uh, to him, uh, you can almost hear his voice as he haughtily said to you that everybody knows, Cecilia, that the quill is mightier than the sword. Mm -hmm. And I will go on more adventures and slay more enemies with the stroke of a pen than you will ever dream of, staring idly at Father's sword above the hearth. Thadric is much older than you. How much older is Thadric than you? I think he's three years. I wrote three years in there. So they're not too far of an age gap, but, like, <laughs> she was always entering, uh, like, whatever realm it was, like, entering, I guess, the young toddler as he was kind of leaving childhood and entering double digits um, a bit more uh, so the, the three years often felt like way more and perhaps even more so because Thedric did excel at his lessons so much so that when the tragedy struck your family uh, that you it, it, it was it had been a couple of years since you had seen Thadric. Thadric yeah. had been sent away to Waterdeep to study with an academy there um, at a much younger age than others might be candidates to study uh, at any of the academies. Um, but uh, your mother, Venora, had some pull, knew some people. Um, she may be a hunter's wife living in a cottage on the edge of the woods, but there was a part of her that uh, always, she always mentioned a sliver of her heart that remained in the City of Splendors. Um, and she was able to send Thedric off to study. Um, but for whatever reason the fates had, Thedric was home the first time in a couple of years when this tragedy struck. Mm -hmm. Even now, you don't know the fate of Melchior, Venora, or Thedric. You have not seen, in all the times you've watched the house from the trees, and now that you finally got up the courage to come here, you've never seen any signs of their bodies. You've never heard anything be told in the area of survivors. Mm -hmm. 
but looking down again. You hold the one unburnt thing that connects you. The Malkior, your father. As you slide the sword back into the scabbard, your hand on the pommel, we see and hear <laughs> a flash of lightning as the rain is falling and you have your hand on the pommel as you are heading into the woods. The town, uh, you've actually been in the woods for maybe 15, 20 minutes uh, heading to the east of this town. And Soren crosses in front of your path in that way that he does when he wants you to stop when there's danger. But there's no wagons to come suddenly around a corner. Mm -hmm. But this time you hear Soren. <sighs> and you see the hackles raise on the back of his neck and his ears lay back as his eyes are darting back and forth. I think at that point, Nasaria would close her eyes just to let one sense go so she can hyper-listen just to see if she gets any inkling of where this might be. What's concerning Soren at this point? Make a perception check. At advantage because of Soren's warning. Okay. Uh, 12. You're trying to close out the sound of the rain, keeping attuned to Soren, one hand just barely grazing his shoulder. It's a wolf. He stands much higher than than yeah. a dog would uh, and you can feel the tension of the muscles uh, but you can also feel as Soren is seems to be looking around also trying to figure out uh, wh what it is so you're quite surprised when you hear at your ear from just behind you Assyria Resha, daughter of Melchior. Imagine my surprise to learn not only that you survived, but when you walked into the very tavern where I was drinking beer, At the sound of his voice, Soren quickly whips around and is snarling. Mm -hmm. You turn and not five feet behind you, Kane Maugram stands there. He's got his hands on his hips, clearly showing that he has a long sword at his belt. He has two axes tucked in to his belt. What I didn't expect. was that the wolf that I'd been tracking for the last ten day was your wolf. Now, I think the best thing that can happen here is you take a step back. Don't even think about trying to unsheath that blade. Keep that bow over your shoulder. I'll even let you avert your gaze while I slit this wolf's throat and be on my way. What makes you think I'm going to let you go near him? Well, the same thing that, that allowed me to get this close to you. On top of that, 
Were you the one that set the fire? <laughs> I'm an opportunist, not an arsonist. Well, then what did you want with my father? I just knew him, is all. Hmm. I travelled with Melchior a bit a couple of years back. I find that hard to believe that he would make the acquaintance of you. What, me? I'm a nice guy once you get to know me. Hmm. Listen, I've got to make my coin somehow. You're not getting Soren. Now, see, that's where you're wrong. I am getting Soren. No. It's how challenging you want to make it. That's going to determine how and when I get Soren. So I guess the bigger question is, is he a prize for you or is he a prize for someone else? No. Oh, that wolf right there, he's a prize for me. Huh, that's what I thought. Now you, on the other hand, an unexpected boon. What do you mean? As I said, I heard what happened to the Ratius. The whole family was sort of burned up. And in the last couple of years, I've not heard peep of anything to suggest that there were any survivors. Hmm. But as I said, I travelled with your father. Not only did I see that sword at his side, I've seen him use it. And one thing Melchior loved was his family. He talked about you all the time. It was like I could just clearly see, no doubt, that you were Melchior's daughter. Now, let me take care of this wolf real quick. And, if you're good, I'll leave you conscious and unharmed huh. as I take you prisoner. No. <laughs> I'm not going to sit down. I'm not some dog, and neither is Soren. So you're going to have to take him over my dead body. Wow. There'll be no prisoners today. No trophies won. And if you had any respect for my father, you would let this go now. Listen, girl, it's got nothing to do with respect. Hmm. Sure. I took what your father taught me, honed it into my own style, hmm. and, well, at this point, he puts his hand on the pommel of his sword. And he says, I'm not playing games here. And I haven't asked yeah, your permission. And he, the sword is on his right side. And with his right hand, he goes and pulls it and sort of shifts his gaze or his grip and You're going to stand there and let me bleed you. Are you going to make this interesting? And he kind of does one of these at you. She won't. <laughs> she won't flinch or anything, expecting any moment he's going to lunge. So she just kind of gives him a really look when he kind of does that. Um, but at that, I think that's the point when she would actually take off running. And as she's saying to Soren, wind, which is his cue to run. And I imagine there's just this moment where there's a sudden <laughs> crash of thunder and lightning, and you use that brief distraction. Mm -hmm. And that's where we cut back to the present, where Cain, now partially transformed, 
with bear claws and a bear face standing in front of you and has just bit you when you tried to stab him with the sword. And it is uh it is yeah, it's your turn in the initiative. Yeah. I'm just um, <laughs> trying to remember where we were. <laughs> uh since he is too close to use the long sword, Sarah is going to switch and grab the hand axe. And try to just right where his head is basically gripping under her neck or okay. bitter. She's just gonna try and hit him with that. Go ahead. Um, and, go ahead and make an attack roll. Uh, am I adding? It's a strength based weapon. Okay. Uh, so that'll be. It's a, a simple weapon, so you would have proficiency as well. Okay, cool. Uh, that's an 18 ahead. Okay. Go ahead and roll damage. Uh, that's Hunter's mark because he's still marked. Actually, wait. I need to roll concentration to see if my Hunter's oh, mark yeah. is still up. Yeah. I need to roll that. Nope. I lose concentration. I rolled a one. Uh, so Hunter's mark is gone. Uh, but that is going to be seven points of damage. Um, as she just right into his neck um, with the hand axe. You you cut down where because he's just exposing it, and you come in, and it sort of cuts across, and his neck is thick, mm -hmm. and you can just feel the tension of the muscles as he's raging, and it, you do cut a scar across, and you feel as you do so, uh, or not a scar, a, a, a gash, as you cut in, and you feel the grip of his jaws loose as his form starts to fall back away from you mm. with the axe embedded in his shoulder. And he just looks at you and his hand that was sort of holding on to this tree where he jumped up to where you're you were on this outcropping you see as it shifts back into a human hand hmm. and his face shifts into human as he's looking at you hmm. and he falls back and he drops 15 feet down to the ground onto his back <laughs> the axe embedded in his shoulder As you look down at him, what do you do after he falls? And it appears as though you've killed him. She is not trusting of this. Um, it's just in her nature. So um, she's kind of going to brush off <laughs> the hit she's taken as best as she can and slowly make her way never losing sight of him um make her way down to him in his fallen form she's not given the signal yet to soren to come out okay but she will make her way down towards him okay you keep your eyes on him and you make mm -hmm. your way down and you're now on even ground where he fell. He's laying there. The rain is washing away the blood that has been spilled. Uh, but he has a gash across his belly. His shirt is stained almost pink from being wet. And the gash across his stomach. The blood uh, is thick on the right side of his chest where this broken arrow uh, pokes out. And, of course, the hand axe that's embedded in his uh, clavicle on his left side. He's just laying there. Medicine check to see if he's still breathing. All right. 
Um, go ahead and make a medicine check. Fifteen. Very shallow breaths that he has a pulse, he's super faint. He has breathing that almost seems like it's faltering. For all intents and purposes, it looks like he's dying. He's going to take Malhyar's sword. Kind of look down at him for a moment. You had the opportunity to walk away from this. But your eyes were too big for the prize. Since you love the forest so much, you'll be here. And she will plunge the sword into his chest at this point. Not wanting to leave any opportunity for him to chase after her. She's yeah. got enough things that she's running from that she doesn't want this. This is personal. He is chasing after Soren. She wants this to be done. As you raise the sword, point down to plunge it into his chest. He's laying there. The wolf fur cloak is askew. You see the wounds, you see he's still, you know, he's wearing that loose spun uh, linen shirt. Uh, but because of the, the gash from the sword and the fighting and everything, it's, it's kind of loose, it's fallen open a bit. And you see uh, where you struck the arrow on the left side, just as you bring the sword down and you're ready to plunge it into his chest. Next to, about three inches to the right, of where the arrow struck him. You see a mark on his chest. There's a black spot about the size of a gold coin. And it is identical to the mark you have on your own chest. She'll hesitate. standing there mm -hmm. looking down at him the sword poised above him the rain is falling it's dripping from your hair your hair is hanging uh, disheveled from the fight uh, you're bleeding from your shoulder uh, where he bit in sank his teeth in moments ago You're just looking at him and you see this mark and you can almost feel the mark on your own chest. What do you do? You see her hesitate and in her mind she's processing and realizing this is an opportunity to ask. But then the counter argument of he's most likely going to lie. And the mark doesn't change anything. He's still hunting Soren. And he wants to take her prisoner. As much as she wants those answers of what that could mean, she is going to continue with the sword after a moment. Plunge downwards. She's not going to be taken without a fight. And she is not leaving this to chance. You drive the sword down, whether intentionally or not, piercing through that mark on his chest. 
for a split second, there's just a almost flinch from yourself. You don't feel anything. You don't feel any pain or anything like that. But it's almost as if on some, some subconscious level, you almost expected to feel the pain when you pierced him. Mm-hmm. His body does not flinch. You pierce the sword all the way through. You feel the sword go through and into the ground behind him where he lays. Would you, after running him through like this, and knowing as well where the mark is located, it's basically mm-hmm. over his heart. Yeah. Um. Would you be satisfied with that and leave? I think she would. She pulled the sword out and whisper in Elvish once she's sure he's gone. Like, dead. yeah, you do a quick doing a quick you, check. There's no pulse. There's no breathing. Um, she will say in Elvish, farewell. Um, she's going to take the cloak with her and the next campfire, she's going to burn it. Okay. But that is satisfaction enough that she will leave him and let nature take its course. Not even giving him a proper burial. You see, as a top down view, as Asaria, you pull the sword out from his chest. You stand there for a moment, the rain, the heavy rain washing away the blood, cleansing the blade, for sheathing your sword. The camera slowly starts moving, panning away upward, and rotating slowly as we see you move the body and unfasten this this wolf cloak and rolling it up. And as the camera gets higher and higher, uh, we we hear you give the command. And Soren comes out of hiding. And pauses momentarily at the body. But from a high top-down view, we watch as you grab the bundle. You motion the Soren, and the two of you head off to the east. And that is where we are going to end this interlude. So good. That was fun. (laughs) That was so good. I had some loose ideas. Uh, like I said, uh, I told told you before we started, I had some loose notes. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we would just kind of play out the scene and see what happened. Uh, we got a little inception there with some flashbacks, within flashbacks, within <laughs> flashbacks. Um, but we basically saw Syria and Soren an indeterminate period of time. Um, but we know, based on Assyria's own admissions about when she had, she noticed the mark, she already has the mark. Mm-hmm. Uh, Kane mentioned the tragedy that happened a couple of years ago. Mm-hmm. So that it's three years or less between this, what we just witnessed, and when Assyria shows up in Candlekeep. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we got to see... Um, Basically, the wolf girl uh, traveling and uh, just a glimpse back to uh, you going to your family home and retrieving the only piece uh, that survived that tragedy. Um, And the very interesting, though short-lived character of Kane Malgram, uh, who presented probably more questions than answers. Mm -hmm. um so i had a lot of fun with that i hope you did too that was so much fun um this is this has been interlude to assyria the wolf girl 
Um, as we mentioned at the top of this episode, uh, because we are taking the month of December off from live streaming, uh, we are pre-recording this ses these sessions. Uh, as such, we don't have session three planned yet. Um, but next week you will be able to return, or if you're watching this in VOD form at a later time, interludes three, four, and five are probably available. <laughs> uh, but we do know that it's going to be uh, in no particular order, uh, Doc, Mizia, and Vorn as we delve into uh, their backstories. And it will surprise no one at this point. Uh, I can almost hear Carrie watching this episode. There are so many similarities in Assyria and Tira in their upbringing and even... By the time this airs, uh, you will have already seen the first episode, but there is a scene that is mentioned in this one that you mentioned. I didn't bring it up. Mm. That is a direct mirror to a scene that happened in uh, our session, mine and Carrie's session. So uh, it's interesting how very different yet very similar uh, Assyria and Tira are, especially seeing where they are in the campaign and the the friendship they're developing and um we'll get to see i'm really curious too to see when we return after all these interludes uh how that affects how everybody plays their characters with these new pieces of information and mm -hmm. and as mentioned before our plan is that we are going to do one of these interludes per tier so the characters just reach level level four in the current campaign somewhere between six and ten 11 and 15 and 16 and 20 we will have at each of those tiers we will have another uh interlude that takes place where we'll get to learn more about the characters in a one-on-one -on -one basis so um thank you everybody for watching um i just want to say again a huge thank you uh, to our incredible community and audience um if you were participating in chat and and those that join us every week we we appreciate you and if you are somebody that lurks silently in the background just absorbing the stories we appreciate you all the same as well you are very important uh to us um and i appreciate all of my players uh dwight and gary ricky and and carrie and of course jordan uh for this interlude without whom each week it would just be me talking to myself for a couple hours <laughs> we are going to go ahead and we are going to end this interlude the same way we end every episode and you can say it with me if you want <laughs> <laughs>